Well, g'day, curd nerds. G'day, curd nerds. Well, 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 g'day, curd nerds, and welcome back to Ask the Cheese Man. This is where you can ask your home cheese making questions, and fingers crossed, I can answer them for you. Uh, it's lovely to see, lovely to see so many people in the chat already, which is absolutely lovely. Um, what was I going to say? Goodness me, it's Sunday morning here in Australia, of course, uh, and we've had some weird weather. Uh, it's been warm and sunny, about 24 degrees, and this is uh, late, yeah, late autumns, nearly, yeah, it's nearly winter for us. Anyway, um, first of all, this is a episode 176, that's what I was going to say. Uh, big shout out to new financial members of the channel. Uh, we've got some new YouTube members, uh, Daniel... Um, D'Angelo, I think that's how you say it. D'Angelo, that's how you say it. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, Zeppa, g'day, Zeppa, how are you? Got some new patrons. Rachel Banks, g'day, Rachel. Thanks for uh, supporting us. Uh, Lydia Utter or Uta, not too sure. I think that's, anyway, thanks, Lydia. Appreciate it. Uh, Phil Jones, thank you, Phil. And Kim Wilson, thank you, Kim. Uh, appreciate it. And we've got some photos uh in the gallery at 8 30 or 30 minutes past the hour where you are um from kim as well as well as many other curd nerds uh just a little bit of housekeeping we have um uh, some interesting videos coming up which is great i've been uh, busily over the week kim has been uh, well enough to process some orders for for me and um I've been busily in the kitchen making up some cheese. So uh, the video this week will be uh, Castle Blue, which um, just got to put the finishing touches on. It's nearly there. Uh, and we'll get that up for members and patrons early access uh, tonight or this afternoon. Depends on how good I am. I'm also in production, uh, we've got some Chili Petite Brie. So some little brie's about the size, a little bit bigger than a camembert. Um, but they are infused with chili, and uh, hopefully uh, the white mold will start growing. I've just seen some hints of white mold, so that won't be too long. Uh, also, we've got uh, Belper Knoll. That is uh, a uh, it's a cream cheese that has garlic and salt of salt, of course, uh, but it's coated in uh, uh, ground black pepper. And it dry, it's dried out over the course of about four weeks. And, uh, yeah, you grate it or shave it or slice it very thinly. It's pretty intense, apparently. So I've got that drying on the rack at the moment. Uh, also, today we're filming um, Mustard and Dark Ale Taste Test. That's ready to go. So we'll try some of that cheese. That should be very interesting. And today I'm hoping to rack the bland or blonde um which is the fermented whey drink that i've been making uh and you'll see snippets of those in upcoming videos because it's always in the background there uh it has cleared up really really well and uh i'm going to rack that which means i'm going to transfer the contents less all the gunk that sits at the bottom which is called lees and we're going to rack that into another uh demijohn and just continue with fermentation. It's still fermenting really slowly at the moment, so um, like ever so slowly, uh, but it's still fermenting. So I'm going to rack it, get it off the lees, which is the gunk at the bottom, and uh, yeah, we'll see how we go. It might take another month or so to finish. It's taking a very long time because I did use a very good yeast, so one that does ferment a lot of the sugars. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, let's get on and say hello to a few people. There's lots of people here. This is fantabulous. Uh, Martin, I oh know, who's the first one? YouTube always is a little bit earlier than the chat that I get here. We've got um, 
Oh, let's say George Prout. I think that's how you say it. Thank you, George. G'day. I uh, got Judy Mack. We've got uh, Dan P. We've got Patricia. Uh, we've got Paul. We've got Vern. We've got Kevin P. We've got Wendy. We've got Martin. We've got Jan C. Uh, oh, Robert and Jan. Uh, lovely to see both of you. Uh, we've got Peter Evans. G'day, Peter. We've got Lordy. Uh, we got um, Kim, of course, who's moderating today. We got Anne. G'day, Anne. We got uh, Deborah, Monique. G'day, Monique. Charlie. G'day, Charlie. Lovely to see you, mate. Uh, I think Charlie has a photo in the gallery today as well. We got Chucky. We got Lane, Lamise. I think that's how you say it. Uh, Michael. We got um, Will and Lindsay and Patrick. And whew, who else? Pauline, g'day Pauline, and Ian, lovely to see you all. All right, fantastic. So with all that out of the way, let's get the show going. Just uh, put that there. And um, all right, let's start with a question, shall we? Let's see if I can find... Where are we? Oh, goodness me, even before I get to the first question, we get a super chat. So that is a um, that flashing light there, the curd nerd light, is a super chat, and that's exclusively to YouTube. Uh, so anyway, let's, let's answer this question. It's from Toby. Thank you, Toby. Appreciate it. Um, hey, Gavin, we've made an Emmental, and it's been maturing for one and a half months. Uh, what should it be like if we cut it open to try it? Should we wait until three? Uh, love to Kim. Uh, yes, wait for the full three months. Uh, don't open it up at the uh, the one and a half month mark. So that's only for six six weeks. Uh, needs a little bit longer. Hopefully, Toby, you're you've got some expansion on the. Um, you know, it's swollen up a little bit, so you can notice the eye development. Um, so, yeah, the, the longer you leave those sorts of cheeses, as in not too long, but the, the more time the propionic shamani or the, the propionic bacteria has time to develop the eyes and to develop the flavour. You want that, that nutty sort of flavour. Um, so, yeah, that, that takes time. All right, we've got another super chat here. Thank you very much for that one, um, Toby. Uh, the next one is from uh, Dan. Oh, I'll kill the light. Sorry, that's not automatic. That's me. It's manual. Um, Dan, thank you so much for your uh, $14 Canadian. Um, hi, Gavin. Question about my cheese that shall not be named, uh, also known as cease and desist. It's been aging for over three months and has begun to bulge. i guessing eye formation. What do you think? Yeah, this uh, could be something that's known as uh, late blown. Uh, it happens in some cheeses. Uh, I've, I've, I've seen it a couple of times in one or two of the very early Parmesans that I made. Uh, and it's caused by a, a, a bacteria, a butonic, a but, uh, let me think. Buteric, yeah, buteric acid, it's called, uh, which is a built is built up in the milk, and and uh, what it does, it causes slight fissures in the uh, the centre of the cheese, uh, and this is called late blown. Now, it's fine; you can eat it. There's no problems there. It's just cosmetic. Um, a lot of people, sorry, a lot of commercial uh, companies, when they make those sorts of cheeses. Um, and not all of them list them on the ingredients list either. It's there's a, a product called um, uh, not lactase. It's called Lysolac, um, and what it is, it's um, egg whites basically that have been powdered, um, and they put them into the milk to start with a very tiny amount for say ten liter batch, and that prevents uh, this butyric acid from building up. Um, and uh, it stops the the fissure, so it's very hard to get hold of. I've tried to get some for our store, Little Green Workshops, uh, where we sell all the cheese supplies, and it's nigh on 
impossible to get uh, retail sorts of um, quantities. You really do have to buy like a five kilo tub, and I just don't have the facilities to repackage stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's very hard to get your hands on, but it's called Lysolac. Um, there may be other names for it as well, and uh, it prevents what's known as late blowing. Anyway, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you so much. Um, I just oh, noticed that I'm not sitting up straight. Hang on, let me fix that. Fix. Here we go. A little bit closer to the camera now. Let's make sure that's all in focus. There we go. That's lovely. Right. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, appreciate the super chat. Now, let's get back to some of the other ones. Uh, Kim Wilson says she's just made it, which is good, Kim, because... You've got some photos in the gallery that we're going to show. All right. So <clears throat> just a quick sip of coffee to start. Let's get to some of the other ones. Okay. Um, Anne says that, uh, hi from Bellingham, Washington. That'd be Washington State in the US, I think. Uh, I just bought your book today. Well, I hope you enjoy it. It is available um, over on um, uh, spring.com, which is the new thing. I mean, let me just, uh, can I do something with this? If you have a look, if you're in YouTube and you go to the YouTube chat, you can actually see the book should be featured now in a second when it gets its act together. It'll be up the top of the chat, and that's my book, Keep Calm and Make Cheese. I'm still working on a, another edition of that, which is the second edition. No, not second edition. It's another volume, not a, an edition. Edition's just adding on to that same work. So it's a whole bunch more recipes. Um, I've had a look at it, and there are... Oh, I've got about five more to write. Uh, the thing is, I keep producing so many recipes um, that uh, it never ends. <laughs> Uh, but, um, yeah, I've got to really pull the plug and say, right, enough is enough and move on and the rest of the stuff can go into another um, volume, I suppose, of um, Keep Calm and Make More Cheese, which is the working title at the moment. All right. Thank you so much for that, though, Anne. Um, Deborah says, um, I watch your videos and love them. Thank you very much, Deborah. Um uh what's this uh, michael says uh hi gavin good to see you back i'm planning on making some reblochon uh type cheese when i get time yeah me too <laughs> um it's a great uh cheese but um i just I mean, and it's very hard to get your hands on in australia um but uh yeah i'm gonna try and get to it um here's a question from what uh, this is from deborah I was wondering how you use fresh sage and spinach leaves. How do you sterilize them? Um, okay, yeah, good question. So uh, when I use a fresh sage, uh, what I do, I put them on an oven tray in, uh, and then put them into the oven to dry them out. Um, so it's just got to be in excess of 100 degrees Celsius in the oven or um, what's that? Uh, 100 degrees Celsius is 212 Fahrenheit. Um, and I only do that for about five minutes and that dries them out. Not so much that they cook and shrivel and all that sort of stuff, but that would kill any uh, bacteria and yeasts that uh, live on the sage. Same as uh, spinach is a little bit different. What I tend to do is blanch the spinach just so in boiling water for about Oh, two or three minutes. Uh, and then if you're going to use spinach, then to make the cheese go green, it's probably best to juice it. Uh, and uh, you soak the curds in the spinach juice, which a lot of commercial cheesemakers who make things like sage derby, they do put powdered sage in and then they put the curds, they soak them in spinach juice. So that's how you do that. And that's how you sanitize them. Okay, great question. So what's the next one? This one's from Will. And Will says, hi, my fresh mozzarella goes mushy really quickly. Uh, what's the best way to store it? I'm using homogenized milk and mild lipase uh, and calcium chloride with your quick mozzarella recipe. 
Yes, it does. It does go mushy very quickly. So within 24 hours, it kind of flattens. Uh, quick mozzarella is just that. It's meant to be eaten quickly, not to be stored. Uh, it has no structure, as in the protein doesn't hold together like normal cheese. Uh, this is because it's made with citric acid and hasn't gone through a proper acidification process uh, like traditional mozzarella, which is either made with raw milk or they add some starter culture to it to get it to the right acidity so it can stretch like a good pasta filata cheese. Anyway, um, so yeah, so eat it within 24 hours. I always tell, well, I used to have um, face-to-face stu students, but I don't anymore. Um, so I tell my students, that's you guys, um, that, you should eat your uh, quick mozzarella within 24 hours. You can't store it. it. It just it doesn't store very well at all. What you can do, though, is freeze it. Um, so you can freeze the balls, you know, after you've made them, the mozzarella balls, using the quick method, of course. Um, and you can then grate them once they're frozen. They're very hard to grate because they're so fresh. Uh, but if you want to make grated mozzarella, then, yeah, best to freeze the quick mozzarella balls um, within a few hours of making them, uh, and that way you, you'll be able to grate them over pizza and all that sort of stuff. So there you go. There's some tips. Um, Lindsay says, um, good morning, Gavin. Attempting my first gouda, gouda this morning, which is fantastic, and best of luck with that. Um, Patrick says, hello from Vegas. <laughs> ah, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, of course. Uh, just some of those blue cheese, just had some blue cheeses named Roaring Forties from King Island, Australia. Amazing, have you ever eaten? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, indeed. King Island Dairy features heavily on my cheese buying um, uh, list. They do some fantastic cheese. The Roaring Forties is a fantastic blue cheese. They normally wax portions of it after it's fully matured, just for storage. Uh, but, yeah, it is a very nice blue cheese, Roaring Forties. Uh, and the reason it's called Roaring Forties is because King Island, which is in Bass, Bass Strait, which is the, uh, the, o the, the, yeah, the ocean passage between mainland Australia and Tasmania, um, gets hit by the Roaring Forties, uh, which is a, a wind... Uh, that comes from the Indian Ocean all the way across the bottom of Australia, across the Great Australian Bight. Okay, there you go. Now we've got that out of the way. But, yeah, great cheese, really nice blue cheese. Okay, Lordy, no, he's talking to other people. Um, Patricia says, um, I'm considering using both spinach and red peppers as colouring for cheese. Any thoughts on the best pr um, procedure for extracting the juice for colouring cheese. Uh, we kind of touched on the spinach one already, Patricia. So you blanch the spinach and then juice it and then soak your curds, curds in that uh, before you mould them and then you'll get a green line, a green marbling through it. Uh, that would work best. I don't know if I'd add the spinach juice to the milk to start with. Probably wouldn't work. However, having said that, having just made chilli petite brie, um, I added the chili water to the milk uh, just after uh, I added the cultures. Uh, and that tended to go quite well. And there's the cheese has a slight red tint uh, because the chili water was quite red, of course. Um, so that might work for you. So uh, the darker the chili water, I suppose. Uh, and by chili water, what I mean is I took chili flakes. And I boiled them on a simmer, sorry, I simmered them uh, in a cup of water for, what was it, five minutes. And the water went totally red and it was really spicy, of course. Then I added it to the milk. Very similar to what I did when I made the uh, triple pepper jack. Uh, and that slightly coloured as well to a, a, a slight red colour. So there's some help, I hope, Patricia. They give you some ideas anyway. Um, Martin says, uh, if you look up commercial kefili on Google images, it often, it often has all a dark, almost gray black rind. I thought the black mold was black, uh, bad. My kefili has 
black spots, but was delicious and did no harm. Um, yeah, the they clean the kefili up before they package it. They wipe it all off. Um, uh, when when cheese is normally aged, um, they will get this kind of mould on the outside. It depends. If they're cloth banded, then yeah, they'll have grey mould. Martin, if you go and check out, and Kim, can you put the link up to the um, why does my cheddar have mould on the outside uh, video or something like that? <laughs> Can't remember the title right now. It's where I bought a commercial um, truckle of uh, cheddar that have been um, that have been cloth banded, and you'll see all the grey mould and stuff on the outside of that. So yeah, it's no big deal. Um, and you'll notice when you make a kefili, it's quite moist anyway, and it does tend to attract a fair bit of mould. So not too much hassle, Martin. So hopefully that helps. Um, Paul says, uh, Gavin, last week I made another cheddar, double Gloucester and uh, Lancashire. My milk fridge had lost cooling to 60 Fahrenheit. Raw bottles used within three days, but not as cold as I like. Problems. I uh, kind of don't understand the question. My milk fridge, you mean your cheese fridge, lost cooling to 60 Fahrenheit. So 60 Fahrenheit is about 17 Celsius. Um, yeah, it's a little bit too, or is that the milk fridge that you stored your milk in? It would be high, fairly high acid, the milk would be, because lactic bacteria grows at high temperatures. So um maybe some problems i would i would on the side of caution um i would use the low temperature long hold method of pasteurization for that milk uh seeing it hasn't been at four degrees c uh before you used it and from the cow so yeah you, you could have some nasties in there but uh yeah do that part that home pasteurization and you should be fine hope that helps paul um next question is um from kapan kapan yeah uh can i use stainless steel saucepan with holes drilled in it as a cheese press i think you mean a cheese basket yes you can uh there actually are versions of uh cheese molds with um that are made from stainless steel. So baskets, molds, that sort of stuff, even hoops. I've used hoops that are stainless steel before and they work fine. Uh, easier to uh, sanitise than the plastic ones, that's for sure. Uh, so I hope that helps. Um, uh, <laughs> Toby says, I think this is about his uh, Emmental. It's so tempting to open. It looks like a sphere. So... Uh, your Emmental looks like a sphere. So it's a lot of eye development, I would think, mate. Um, and at only six weeks, it'll have a mild flavour. So if you think that it's not going to expand any further, uh, then, yeah, maybe it's time to open it and have a look. But remember, if you do open it, uh, you may, and you want to preserve some for ageing, you won't get any further eye development. But if you backpack it, then you will get an increase in flavour if you keep it at the maturation temperature for a little bit longer. It, those sorts of cheeses don't tend to age well. They're, they're better eaten when the recipe says they should be eaten. Anyway, moving right along. Um, <clears throat> this is from Kevin P. He says, hi, Gavin. Is it possible to add ingredients to an already pressed mature cheddar if I fancy changing the flavour, is it possible to repress a mature cheese? Um, yeah, commercial uh, operations do it all the time. Uh, there was this um, cheese video I watched. What was it? It was they were making a chilli cheddar. Um, and what they did, they basically shredded the mature cheese um, and they then um, mixed... Uh, chili flakes with it, and then they repressed it into a, a wheel. Uh, now, the press they used was uh, a really high pressure type thing, so it may be difficult to replicate at home, 
Um, but yeah, you wouldn't, certainly you could eat it straight away after you put some flavor in it. But uh, I would wait for a little while um, before uh, tasting it so the flavor's kind of infused. But that's what they do. They just get mature cheese, um, shred it or crumble it and um, buy machines and put in the chili and away they go. All righty. Um, uh, and Lordy um, says the same thing. It says, most cheese companies mix processed and matured cheese. I don't see why not, indeed. Um, <clears throat> uh, Aga says, hi, Gavin. Yalsberg, awesome cheese. Wish I was allowed to make some more. Mate, you're going to have to set up a clandestine operation, um, not in your basement, rent a small room somewhere and start making cheese so the missus doesn't find out. Uh, very cool. Um, anyway, um, let's have a look. Uh, this is from Cindy, I think. Yeah, Cindy says, I love your cheese wisdom. I inherited loving cheese from my dad. Uh, melted is my favourite way to enjoy cheese. Thank you, Cindy. Um What's this one? We, this is from uh, Winter's Hero. I think that's how you say it. Howdy. Um, I wanted to say thank you for your all, all your amazing videos. You are the Ben Kenobi of cheese. Ah, uh, yes, Padawans. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I was curious if you're planning to do any more vegan cheese recipes. Um, uh, not so much at the moment. Uh, I am s still got many, many different dairy style cheeses but on the odd occasion um i will throw in something that may be nut based but you know just to mix it up a little bit occasionally but not all the time um this is more a dairy cheese channel we've got another super chat going down here i'm not sure where it is but and who it is oh it's paul thank you paul for your kind ten dollars us um Right, he says, Gavin, to clarify, my raw milk was stored in a fridge that lost cooling. Ah, the milk was 55 to 58 when I started normal heating. Should I dump the cheese? Yeah, if you've already made cheese with it, I I wouldn't trust it, honestly. Uh, if your raw milk was sitting above four degrees Celsius for three days, then yeah, it would be highly acidic. It would have all sorts of bacteria in it not just the good beneficial lactic bacteria. Uh, I personally, I would need it. So that's just my opinion, but I'll leave it to you to make the decision, Paul. But uh, thank you so much for your kind super chat. Um, okay, so let's get back to some of the other questions. Um, I can find where I was. A lot of you guys ask a lot of questions. There we go, which is fantastic because otherwise we wouldn't have much of a show if you didn't. All right, this one's from Chasp X. My camembert is maturing for seven days now. Uh, it started to develop white rind. When I turned it daily and washed it, part of the white rind sticks to the sushi mats and rips off the cheese. Any suggestions? Ooh. Normally you turn it daily to prevent that sort of thing from happening because I find that when it sits for, oh, if you don't turn it for a few days, um, maybe three, four days, then it tends to stick, but not daily, very rarely. Um, I would suggest that you're getting a lot of proteolysis, which is the breakdown of the proteins, and that's due to high temperature. Uh, and sometimes not enough salt. Um, so uh, the camembert should be matured around about 7 degrees Celsius uh, for the first uh, week. And then, then oh, sorry, yeah, until they grow mould, until you see the mould. All right, that's time for the gallery. We'll get to that in a second, but I'll finish this question. So, yeah, 7 degrees Celsius for the first two weeks odd until it grows mould, and then you wrap them and put them in the normal fridge for them to mature further any temperature higher than that then they tend to go runny just underneath the mold uh, and that's when you get trouble when you try and turn them and they stick to the to the sushi mat or the bamboo mats or the reed mats whatever you're using there uh, plastic mats i find don't tend to have this issue too much 
especially daily turning. You don't rarely do I ever see anything like that happen. Uh, it's because the sushi mats suck a lot of the moisture out of the cheese. They're better for harder cheeses and stuff like that. I have used sushi mats in the past, um, but I haven't come across this problem uh, because you really do have to develop those sorts of cheeses at lower temperature. Hope that helped. All righty, time for the gallery. Let's have a look. Um, and we have, let me just set this up. Take me two seconds to get my act together. Where the heck's that gone? Right, there we are. Um, we want a window. There we go. Hey, ho. Rightio. So there we go. We have the first cheese of the week is from Charlie. And Charlie says, he's got a little bit of a note here. This is called, um, oh, can I even try and say it? It's a Maltese cheese called, uh, uh, I can't pronounce it. It's spelled, here we go. Here's the spelling. Um, it's spelled G-B-E-J-N-I-E-T, Yebnet, I think, maybe, Tal Bazaar. Anyway, I don't, probably made that a mess of that, Charlie. So sorry. Anyway, these little Maltese cheeses or Maltese cheeselets with pepper is a better way to say it in English. Um, uh, he, right, here we go. Um, he says he has a problem with it, and the problem is that he loves eating it and so does his family. That's the problem. Um, but here, number one, the uh, which is the first picture here, you can see my little mouse pointer. Uh, this is in its fresh state, uh, used for cooking with. Uh, number two, they're salted um, and air-dried for a few days. Number three, which is down here, is after a few hours soaked in a vinegar bath, which is quite unique to this cheese, and then they turn white again. And then number four, they get rolled in some freshly ground pepper and are ready to eat. Uh, this lot only lasted a few days. So fantastic Maltish, Maltese cheese. Charlie did give me the recipe. I've got to dig that up and make this great little cheese, or maybe I'll get him to show me how to make it. So very interesting indeed. Thank you so much, Charlie. Appreciate that. The next picture is from uh, Daniel and uh, Daniel Price. And this is a cheddar that he made. And this is infused with homemade wine that he made himself. So it's uh, Zinfandel is the wine's name. I hope I got that right. Um, and uh, you can see some fantastic marbling there. That looks absolutely amazing. So that's a great looking cheese. I would present that on any cheese platter. Great work, Daniel. Very good, mate. This is another one from Daniel. This is an Edom that... Uh, uh, got a little bit of eye development. You can see that, uh, yeah, it, they aren't mechanical. Huh. Um, and the reason you can tell that is because the eyes are shiny. Have a look at the eyes there. I, yeah, that's pretty large. I can't make it any larger. So the eyes are shiny. So um, definitely gas development. It probably used some sort of um, starter culture that produced a little bit of gas, but uh, that looks quite amazing. Um and he said that uh, it tasted fantastic. This one's from Kevin P. This is his Budakaiser um, and uh, great looking cheese there. He said he vacuum packed it. That's why it looks a bit funny on the outside, but that's okay. Um, it's not the visuals. I'm As far as I'm concerned, it's not what it looks like. It's how it tastes. Um, but uh, there's the inside of the Budakaiser. And it looks really good. Uh, a few little mechanical holes. That I, yeah, they're not eyes. Um, but uh, it's pretty hard to press them, uh, judge the pressman, because it's kind of a light pressing for a Budokaza compared to, say, a cheddar, which is a very heavy pressing. Uh, and he said that tasted fantastic, and it's a family favourite now. All right. So this is from Kim Wilson and... Uh, Kim's in the chat, as far as I can remember. This is a cheese that she made. This is her first brie. Uh, I think there's a better shot there. And you can see that the paste in the middle just starting to bulge there as it comes to room temperature. And apparently uh, her and her husband both said it was an amazing cheese. So well done, Kim. 
There's another one from Kim. This is a triple pepper, Jack. Uh, a little bit of mole growth on top. Uh, only reason I'm showing this one is because I recommended to her, uh, and make that a bit bigger. There we go. I recommended it to her that just give it a um, wash with some brine. That may wash some of the chili off. Uh, so a simple brine solution before she vacuum packs it, um, which is what she probably should do. So that'll clean that up. But yeah, good looking cheese underneath, I reckon. I don't think there are any more photos that um, show that. Let me just have a quick look. No, that's it. Okay, this next one's from um, Michael McCarty. And this is uh, Michael's um, Brie. It's, you can see it's got um, the outside rind around uh, the edge here um, is, it, I reckon it's pretty runny underneath. Uh, and the reason I can tell that is because the shape of the rind, um, so either the temperature was a little bit too high, uh, which could possibly happen with a brie. Um, it doesn't look very flat, so doesn't have that traditional brie shape. But he's quite a large cheese. Um, and you can see that there. This is his ripening box. So he's got a small one there, camembert size. And this one looks like it's oh, at least, what's that, five and a half, maybe six inches across. Uh, so it's a little bit large and thick. Uh, it's it's too thick for a, for a brie. So you'll get some all sorts of different sorts of... Um, things going on there but uh yeah i think it'll probably still turn out michael i can't see why it wouldn't um i think that is the end of the gallery let me just have a look quick look yeah that's it for this week now if you want to um uh if you want to oh there i am uh if you want to submit your picture for the gallery let me just show you how um we'll do a quick uh here we go. Let's share that. It, no, don't do that, Gav. Um, find your YouTube channel. Very hard to do when you've got so many channels. Right, let me just share this for you, and uh, we will um, show you how. So whoop, there we go. All righty, so this is the channel without me logging in because I've, I'm the owner and it shows all sorts of weird stuff. So if you want to send me a um, your pictures, then go to the About tab here of the channel. Um, so you can go to youtube.com slash Gavin Webber, one word, um, or just do a search and go to the About tab here. And down here in this Details section, uh, you'll see this says for business inquiries, sign in to see the email address. That's the email address that you need to send your photos to. Um, so please send me your photos of your cheese that you've made and we will show them in the gallery at uh, 30 minutes past the hour um, when the show starts. So that's how you do it. Go to the About tab, go down to Details and click the little business inquiries thing that always works and i get some lovely photos from everybody as you saw okay yes thank you clock yes we did that already <laughs> all right um on to some more questions before we do <clears throat> very nice okay right next question this is from Jan and Jan says, uh, send pictures of cheese I've been making to my son and Arizona in Arizona. Maybe he showed them to his boss, and now he's hooked on your YouTube channel and wants to start making cheese too. The word does spread. Thank you so much, Jan. Appreciate that on uh, that lovely publicity. Any publicity is good publicity. Um, all righty. Um, What's this one? This one's from uh, Lim Jock Jochen. There we go. I think I say so. Hi, Gav. Love your videos. Quick question. In some of your videos, you say something along the lines of turn the cheese once a week whilst in the cheese cave. What do you mean by turning it? Um, I mean, you get the top and bottom and flip it over. That's what I mean by turning it. That was an easy question, wasn't it? Uh, and you'll see that in some uh, upcoming videos uh, if you 
watch some. Um, I flip the cheeses all the time. Just flip them over, turn them, flip them so that the top becomes the bottom and the bottom becomes the top. Uh, it helps distribute the fats as it's maturing. Uh, it also prevents it from sticking to the bottom of the cheese mat. Uh, yeah, that's about it. That's what it does. Helps promote even ripening. Anyway, um, uh, Peter says, have I ever tr had stinking bishop, which is a British cheese, uh, and have you ever come across a recipe for it? I've been searching high and low and haven't had any luck. Word is it's the smelliest cheese made. Um, yes, I have tried stinking bishop, and yes, it did smell. Uh, it's a blue cheese, if I remember rightly. Uh, and it was had a very strong taste. Um, but I think it was quite old because the one that I got, um, being from the UK, was um, slightly dry. So it had dried out a bit um, and wasn't as luscious, as I suppose, as it was when it was originally matured. Um, but, yeah, it is fairly stinky cheese because it grows a lot of... Um, red mold on the outside of the blue mold as well i don't know if they introduce it and unfortunately peter i haven't seen a recipe either so it must be a pretty closely guarded secret for stinking bishop but here's a suggestion i know you're one to experiment so what you could do is make a uh let me think make a stilton style which i think it's based on and add some Breviobacteria linens to it, as well as the Penicillium Rogue 40. Hopefully you get a bloom as well, but if you wash it, after you see that blue bloom and pierced it, and hopefully there's some blue development in the middle, then start washing it with brine and maybe some Breviobacteria linens, and you will find that you'll get yourself a stinking bishop as well, I reckon. But uh, yeah, let me know how that goes if you give it a go. All righty. Um, Next question is from, uh, this one's from Derek. And Derek says, my Parmesan is dotted with brown and white spots. There are no difference to the texture than the rest of the rind. Is it this okay? What is causing it? Uh, yeah, look, this is just aging spots. It's like, like humans <laughs> get aging spots. Um, you'll notice this in hard uh, cheeses. So things like... Um, I particularly noticed it in Gruyere when I've made that. That's a hard cheese. Uh, not as hard as Parmesan, of course, but it those aged cheeses tend to uh, get brown spots, um, white spots, that sort of thing on them, as long, long as they're not pink and yellow, which is a fluorescent mould that you don't want. It means it's too moist. Um, but, yeah, brown and white spots. And you'll eventually see that, uh, and it happened with my Gruyere, a couple of Gruyers that I made, um, the brown goes all over it eventually. So it's discoloration of the rind. So you can do that, uh, and that will work quite well. Um, so give that a go. Uh, what else? We've got uh, Jim saying hello. What time did that come? Let me just have a look. 8.24. Jim, you're late, mate. Um, hello, Gavin and Kim. Great to see the... Uh, Nerd, heard, king and queen present and uh, appeared as in being good health. Love you guys. Thank you, mate. Appreciate it. Um, oh, where are we? <clears throat> Judy says that she would like to create, recreate a truffle manchego that which had veins of truffle through it. I have freeze-dried truffle. Would you add dried truffle or moisten it first? Hmm. Haven't had much experience with the old truffle cheese as yet. Um, I'm waiting for truffle season here in Australia um, and uh, uh, going to get some sent to me. So I haven't had much experience with it besides eating it, of course. And I've never heard of a truffle manchego. So I would use dried truffle in indeed um, and mix it through the curds before pressing uh, that's what I'm hoping to do, but I'm going to make a, um, a stabilised paste um, white mould cheese with the truffle that I get. But with Manchego, if you've got some dried, finely chop it or break it up, however it goes, grate it probably would be the best. And then mill it through the, um, uh, mill it through the curds before you press it. 
and put it in the basket. So that's how I do it, Judy. Um, here's a question from Kapan again. Uh, I want to make a Parmesan, so I need one that will survive high pressures. Do you mean the ice cream tubs you get from supermarkets filled with ice cream? I think there's some other conversation going on there. I'll let them get on with it. Um, here's a question from uh, Kev V. says, anyone ever infuse with blue butterfly pea pea flour or maybe regular tea? Yeah, look, you could soak your... Um, curds in uh, a tea it may have to be a fairly strong tea just get a bit of little color and maybe a little bit of flavor you won't get too much i have seen um a butterfly pea flower as in not the flower but as in f l o u r that kind of flower um but yeah i haven't used it in cheese making but uh, yeah it's be quite interesting color um Question from uh, Tross, I think. Um, my curds aren't coming out totally uniform. Any fix on that? Uh, you'll find that it's very hard to get uniform curds, but uh, best way to do it is if you can get yourself some sort of curd cutting device, curd harp, what have you, uh, you will find that uh, your curd cut is a lot better than what it normally would. I know that when I first started using the curd harps that were sent to me, um, and there is a link below, I believe, to a um, uh, an affiliate of mine, a, a nice guy called Steve Benz, who is now shipping a stainless steel curd harp that I've been featuring in my videos of late. Um, and that helps. That certainly helps. Uh, and stir gently so they don't break up. That's another good one. Another good tip. Um, uh, Patrick says that uh, if the cheese man says he would not eat it, uh, maybe don't eat it. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. Um, Lindsay says the 165 millimeter hard cheese hoop you use, uh, is it possible to get the same design at 200 millimeters, um, which is 20 centimeters, which is, I don't know what it is in imperial but um no unfortunately not they only make the 165 uh and it's actually made in queensland in australia um i get them from a wholesaler uh and they only make one size that's it one size fits all um unfortunately there's no 200 millimeter version sorry about that um rachel says hi gavin hi rachel love to see you um where else is this? Where are we? Um, this one's from Lim again. Uh, another question: Is there any reason why vacuum pack, why vacuum packing a cheese to age won't work every time? Are there some cheeses that can can't be vacuum packed? Uh, yeah, good question. So here, here's my advice on vacuum packing. Uh, Semi-hard, hard cheeses, no problems at all. Vacuum pack to your heart's content. Any cheese that you'll normally wax, you can vacuum pack. Having said that, if you're making a cheese that has some eye development, uh, I would tend to wax those if... Uh, so a good example of that would be Jalsberg or, or Emmentaler. I tend to let them have a natural rind first and then as they expand... Um, sometimes I wax them. Depends on the environment that I'm trying to do it in. Um, what's another one? Um, so, yeah, uh, an another cheese that I tend not to vacuum pack so much is um, Havarti. Uh, Havarti is a very soft cheese. It tends to flatten if you vacuum pack it, like squeeze the heck out of it, it goes really flat. Uh, I tend to wax that, um, but it's a very quick, quickly aged cheese. So if you can keep the mould off it, it's probably the best way to do that. Um, also, any mould ripened cheeses, so white mould ripened cheeses, uh, any blue mould ripened cheeses, and any red mould or brevi battery linens um, ripened cheeses all need oxygen, so you cannot vacuum pack them. Don't even think about it during maturation. However, once your blue cheese is an exception to the rule once your blue cheese is fully mature and you're happy with the taste 
then yes, you can vacuum pack it for storage only, not for maturation. So there's some hints and tips on vacuum packing your cheese. Um, Patricia says, Maltese cheese. My husband would be so excited if I made that for him. Good on you, Charlie. Yeah, indeed, Charlie. In fact, um, uh, if you have the recipe again, mate, I'm, I, I cannot remember where I put it. If you could shoot that through in an email, that would be fantastic, mate. Uh, you know my email address. Um, so that would be good. Uh, a wine marble cheese sounds interesting. Indeed, it does. Uh, I've made many marble sorts of cheeses and w just soaking your curds in wine. I think if you look at the stout cheddar recipe that I've got, and Kim, if you can put the link up for the stout cheddar recipe, just substitute the, the stout for red wine and soak it for the same amount of time and you'll get the same result. It'll be fantastic. Um, here's a question from Seth. Seth says, I made a Parmesan which I waxed. After a few months, it expanded and broke the wax. I discovered that air voids had formed in the cheese. That caused it to expand. What happened? Uh, it became late blown. I've already gone through that. Uh, we talked about butyric acid and what you can do to prevent that. So um, you, the butyric acid is usually caused. This one thing I didn't talk about was it's caused by the off gases, the acid does. It's caused by the animals that produce the milk eating silage or fermented grass. Uh, and that's the main cause that where it ends up in the milk. Um, if the animals eat fresh pasture uh, and uh, don't go near silage, then you'll find that uh, you don't get this very, usually it happens in the winter months. Um, and that's certainly what I found for sure. All right, thanks for that link too, Kim. Appreciate it, love. Um, Let's have a look, talk about photos. Um, what's this one? Um, Michael says, I believe Stinking Bishop is washed with pear cider. Very nice. Um, definitely do you the bee linens. And uh, just to follow up on that, Peter says, I'll try the bee linens. Uh, that was kind of my thinking, even though I never tasted it. Yeah, that's, uh, and a lot of people are saying, Karen says, Stinking Bishop is washed in pear cider or peri. Indeed. Oh, I reckon they put some brevi bacterial linens in the cider and in the wash. Um, okay. Here's a question or a statement from Kim says, we stopped at Yancey's Fancy of Corfu, New York, and bought some Bergenost. I think that's how you say it. Uh, it was quite tasty. In fact, we ate it all. They also had ghost pepper cheese, which was quite good. Um, yeah, I think that's um, in response to the um, triple pepper jack that you made, Kim. All right. Um, where are we? Lordy says, eh, I'm growing some cayenne pepper. Uh, do you have any advice for somebody living in a cold climate? Uh, probably more for my vlog channel, but yeah, I, cayenne peppers, they have to be kept warm, that's for sure. Don't let them get frost bitten. Uh, they will all die. Um, I don't know anything else you're after. Uh, I would dry them before I add them to the cheese, for sure. Uh, they are very, very hot, and I've grown them and used them in food as well. But typically what they do is dry the cayenne pepper out. It's just a little chilly about that long, very long, slender chilli. They dry them out, and then they crush them. They power, make them into a powder, that's why. Most cayenne pepper you see in um, in spice racks and stuff like that is finely ground. Um, but, yeah. Okay. Um, Seth says, uh, thanks for the info about the gas in the cheese. Indeed, it was raw milk. Indeed. Um, and you do find that some of those raw milk cheeses happens, and that's why they add uh, lysolac to it so you don't get too many problems. All right, so um, Kim's putting up the uh, the links to wrap up the show. And if you want to support the show, don't forget you can pop over to <clears throat> patreon.com slash Gavin. That's just my very old username for a, a blog that I used to write. 
Um, but yeah, that's how you support me on the show. Or you can go to the YouTube join button down below if you're on YouTube. Uh, don't forget, you can also go to the merch link. The merch for the show is cheesemantv.creator-spring.com. Uh, and we've got a visitor. Um, let me just have a look. Here he is. Mr. Pumpkinhead. Come here, Mr. Hamish. Oh, there he is. What a nice boy. Oh, thank you, mate, for the kiss. You know, look at the people. They're over here. Say hello. I know Holly's behind. I don't know how many people saw her. But Hamish, face the camera. Here we go. Oh, say hello. Oh, he does a one, two. All right, there he is. Hey, Mr. Cheese Dog. He features heavily. Pumpkin Dog. It, pumpkin dog. Yes, uh, well, I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a story on Thursday night if you go and visit the live stream for the vlog uh, about Pumpkin Boy. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a very funny story. Uh, but we don't have time for that today. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, appreciate you turning up once again. And thank you for the lovely gallery pictures that people sent in for the gallery today at 30 minutes past the hour. Um, good news. Holly's doing very well as well, even though she's getting, she's becoming quite an old dog. Um, uh, so yeah, everything's going swimmingly in the, uh, the Weber household. So that's lovely. So we will see you next uh, Sunday, same time, same channel. Uh, I won't say same bat time, same bat channel, but yeah, <laughs> it's the same time. And uh, yeah, thank you once again for all your fantastic questions. Without your questions, we really wouldn't have a show. So thank you so much. And we will see you next time. <laughs>